Hello, Kristen Knudsen, Production Manager and Technical Director at the College Light Opera Company, coming to you from the Highfield Theater. Behind the Scenes with Kristen Knudsen is made possible by a generous gift from Clyde Tyndale and Deb Winograd. Over the past few weeks, we've been handling an extensive <laughs> electrics maintenance project. Every single lighting instrument here at the Highfield is being cleaned, tested, and repaired, and we're updating our inventory a bit. I have some footage from the repair work that I'd like to share with you, including some peaks inside the instruments as we're repairing them. I'm also going to give you a demonstration of several lighting instruments we have in our inventory, just for fun. But first, let's start with a very, very quick history of lighting, <laughs> theatrical lighting, which starts with the history of lighting, honestly. So here we go. I have such a wealth of content related to lighting, this will be a special two-part episode. This week, we're focusing on lamps and lighting fixtures themselves. Next week, we will pick back up with the history of dimmers and control boards, as well as taking a look at some modern LED and moving light instruments. The theaters of ancient Greece were open-air venues, typically placed on a hillside and oriented so afternoon sunlight came from behind the audience, illuminating the performance space. The sun was the sole lighting instrument, apart from handheld terracotta lamps fueled by fats and oils that helped indicate to the audience when it was supposed to be night. Performances were simply held during daylight hours, and that was that. For most of the world, until the 16th century, theater was mainly a public, outdoor event. As performances made their way indoors and illumination became necessary, tallow candles, torches, and hanging oil lamps provided dim lighting, sometimes colored for dramatic effect by placing the light source behind glass flasks of colored water. It was necessary for stagehands to walk about trimming wicks during the performance, sometimes snuffing out the flame to darken the stage. In the early 17th century, theaters started to employ the use of reflectors to intensify the appearance of candle and lamp flame. Footlights and wing lights appeared. These lighting sources became increasingly hidden from the audience through the use of wing and border masking, creating the delineation between the stage lighting and the general audience lighting. By the late 1700s, candlelight was replaced by glass-chimneyed kerosene lamps that burned brighter and cleaner. Lighting technology advanced quickly during the 1800s. The first successful adaptation of gas lighting for the stage was demonstrated in London's Lyceum Theatre in 1803. In 1816, Philadelphia hosted the first fully gaslit theatre in the world, the Chestnut Street Theatre. The rest of the theater world followed suit, and by the 1850s, gas lighting had spread throughout the United States and Europe. Gas flame was brighter than oil lamps, even without a reflector, and dimming effects could be achieved by regulating the flow of the gas, which I'll discuss in more detail next week. But along with the intensity of gas lighting came the increased fire hazard. Even with guards and screens helping contain the open flame, the danger was significant. Footlights would catch actors' costumes aflame if they got too close, and many theaters fell victim to tragic fires that killed performers and audience members alike. During the dawn of gas lighting, British engineer Thomas Drummond invented the limelight in 1816, though it did not come into heavy use until a few decades later. Limelight is the incandescent reaction of a cylindrical block of lime heated by a focused oxyhydrogen gas flame until it glows a bright white. Though the light was quite brilliant, the point of illumination was small, so mirrored reflectors were necessary for control. Limelight produced a sharp point of light from a distance, and thus became the earliest form of a spotlight or follow spot. The first electric carbon arc lamp was exhibited in 1808, invented by chemist Sir Humphrey Davy of England, who also happened to be involved in the creation of early photography technology, the discovery of the effects of nitrous oxide gas, and the invention of the miner's safety lamp. A carbon arc lamp is comprised of two carbon rods connected to an electrical source, with the ends of the rods spaced just right so electrical current will arc between them, creating an intense white light. If you're familiar with arc welding, it's a very similar effect. Carbon arc lamps were not enclosed like modern incandescent lamps, though they were often shielded by glass cylinders or closed inside lantern housings. The Paris Opera was an early adopter of electric arc lamps for special effects like beams of sunlight, lightning, and rainbow projections, as well as the earliest electric spotlight, which was a carbon arc and reflector housed in a hood with a lens and a shutter. Carbon arc lamps were also utilized inside fixtures called magic lanterns, which were precursors to modern slide projectors, originally developed using candlelight in the mid-1600s. 
The carbon arc lamp was the light source for the original Klieg lights produced for film work starting in 1911. Although the technology was largely phased out as incandescent light bulbs became more common, until after World War II, carbon arc lamps remained the go-to for high-intensity light sources inside searchlights and movie projectors. Thomas Edison's 1879 electric lamp marked the beginning of the modern era of stage lighting. Gas lighting quickly fell by the wayside, and within a year, the Paris Opera had introduced a new electric lighting system. In the early 1900s, electric lamps became increasingly sophisticated, with metallic filaments replacing carbon and inert gas replacing vacuum chambers. Gradually, the arc spotlight disappeared, and the tungsten halogen lamp became the new standard. Around 1900, as electric lighting developed, there came a need for quantifiable descriptions of illuminance. You may have heard the term foot candle used in reference to lighting intensity. One foot candle is the amount of illumination on a one foot square area, one foot away from a one candela light source. One candela, sometimes interchangeable with the term candle power, is the base unit of luminous intensity originating from the power of a common wax candle. Similarly, the metric unit of illumination, known as lux, is the amount of illumination produced on a one meter square surface, one meter away from the light source. As a visual reference, the sun's illumination on a summer day may exceed 10,000 foot candles, while the light reflected by the moon at night is closer to 0 0.002 foot candles. You may be more familiar with the term lumens, commonly found on packaging for household light bulbs. Lumens are a measurement of luminous flux, or the total amount of visible light a lamp puts out, while candelas are a measure of luminous intensity or brightness in a particular direction. Now, we can't talk about modern theatrical lighting without mentioning important developments in lens technology. The earliest instances of lenses were water-filled spheres used by the Greeks and Romans around 300 BC. Optical glass lenses as we recognize them today were not developed until the end of the 13th century, though spectacles and magnifying glasses did appear a little earlier. The first compound microscope using two lenses was invented in 1590, and the telescope first appeared around 1600, though it was later refined by Galileo. French engineer and physicist Fresnel designed a lens system for lighthouses that is still in use today and heavily influenced modern theatrical lighting. The Fresnel lens features concentric stepped rings, each consisting of an element of a simple plano convex lens, but assembled on a flat surface. Essentially, only the portions of the lens that contribute to bending the light's rays are kept. This made large lighthouse lenses possible when previously the sheer weight and thickness of the equivalent plano convex lenses would have been prohibitive. The short focal length and narrow concentrated beam of a Fresnel lens was perfect for lighthouses and searchlights, and eventually made its way into theatrical spotlight fixtures commonly known as Fresnels in the 1920s. The Highfield Theater has been operating since the 1930s, and some of our equipment may even be that old. Although there have been advances in computerization and LED technology in recent decades, theatrical lighting instruments haven't changed much since the mid-20th century. I would like to give you a close-up look at some of the instruments in our Highfield inventory, a few workhorses of the industry, as well as a couple less common oddities. I do want to start with a disclaimer that I do not consider myself an electrician. Although I have a lot of common sense knowledge, it is not my specialty. If you're ever working with theatrical lighting instruments, take great caution. The lamps can be very, very hot. There's always danger of burns. There's danger of electrical shock. There's even danger of broken glass should a lamp explode. So be very, very cautious when you're working with these lighting instruments or working with any kind of electrical equipment at all. Be smart, be safe. This instrument is an ETC Source 4. It's an ERS, or Ellipsoidal Reflector Spotlight. This style of lighting instrument is also commonly referred to as a LECO. 
There are many different brands and styles of Lico instruments. Um, ETC happens to be a very dominant company in the theater world. Uh, but uh, the, all ellipsoidal reflector spotlights operate under the same principles and have many of the same features. So I'm gonna demonstrate on this instrument today how to do some focusing and we'll show you some of the innards and bits and pieces and how this thing comes apart. The Source 4 was first released in 1992 and uses an incandescent high performance lamp with four filament strands, which gave the unit its name, Source 4. These fixtures are designed to be easily focused without the use of a wrench. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the barrel out of this instrument to get the lenses out of the way so I can show you how the lamp or bulb looks inside of the unit. I'm gonna glow it up a little bit for you so you can see it. So the barrels on these are super easy to swap. Just slide right out. ETC offers interchangeable lens tubes in a variety of field angles. This unit happens to be a 50 degree. All lens tubes are the same, but the number of lenses, their focal length, and their placement within the tube determine the resulting angle. Lenses are marked with colored dots that indicate type and orientation. I'm using a testing dimmer to control the light for this demonstration. You'll probably notice in the footage that my camera is attempting to focus and adjust for the light differences, so this is not the most accurate representation of the brightness, but you still get an idea of what's happening inside of the instrument. I'm using the theater curtain as a focusing surface so you can see the shape and spread of the beam. I can tune how crisp the edge of the beam looks by sliding the barrel in and out. Once I'm happy with how it looks, I lock it off by tightening the knob. Let's take a look at some shutter cuts. As the light passes through the aperture on the interior of the instrument, the image of the light is mirrored. So if I want to cut off the top of the beam, I need to raise up the lower shutter. Here's another view directly behind the light making some shutter cuts. I took the lens tube out again so I can give you a clear view of what the shutters are doing on the inside of the fixture. Um, the instrument is actually off. You're actually seeing glow from my camera light. <laughs> The, that just shows how intense the dichroic coating is on the inside of that reflector. The entire barrel with the shutter assembly can rotate uh, several degrees. This allows you to make some fine-tuned adjustments if you're having trouble getting your shutters to land precisely where you want them. The Source 4 has a standard gobo or pattern holder slot right below this shutter handle and then beside it there is a larger slot you can open up that is for accessories like, well, I'll show you. 
This is a drop-in iris that you can place in the unit to create an even narrower beam. These are gobo or pattern holders. The word gobo stands for something like goes between or goes before optics. The, the actual origin is debated. Gobos are small metal stencils that allow you to apply a pattern or texture to your lighting beam. We also have some glass pattern holders that fit in the Source 4 accessory slot. Glass patterns are similar to gobos. They behave a lot like stained glass. Here's an example of a gobo rotator. There are several different styles. Uh, but these allow you to place a gobo pattern or a glass template into a slot or multiple slots and rotate them at different speeds in different directions to create special effects. These are gel frames, typically made of metal, but it is possible to find them in cardboard. They are used to support lighting gel, which is a colored plastic film. Gel is used to apply color and sometimes diffusion to your lighting. I happen to find this piece of very pale gold gel, so I'm going to demonstrate here, and the difference will be very subtle, but you should be able to tell that there's a color shift. Time to put away this Source 4 and bring out our next light. So this is a safety cable and uh, it's not going to do much anything on a vertical boom with no horizontal arms, uh, but normally imagine this were a horizontal pipe. You want to make certain that you've wrapped around your hanging position and then clipped back through to the cable. This is just an, a last line of safety in case the clamp were to fail so that the instrument can only fall a few inches and not land on the audience's heads. This instrument is a source for PAR. Now, uh, PAR lamps are extremely common all over the world. Uh, this particular instrument is a little different because it has a removable lens rather than having a lens that's molded into the lamp itself. But you know, if you've got a floodlight in your yard, chances are it's a PAR lamp. Um, they used to be used for like car headlights, all sorts of things. There are a lot of different types of PAR cans that exist. There are many older models um, with a PAR can, not, not one of these, but with a PAR can, an older model, it's typically just like literally a big tin can with a, a fully enclosed bulb fixture inside. And it would still have this rotational feature so you'd have to reach into the back of the lamp, grab onto the base of the bulb unit and rotate it in its socket. Very hot chance of shocking yourself, not real safe. Um, so what ETC did is they put the actual lens on a rotating ring so you never have to reach inside the unit to focus the beam. The lenses are also interchangeable. They 
are all basically floodlights and spotlights. This one looks to be either a medium or wide flood. Any lamp with a PAR style lens is going to generate a slightly oblong beam, which you can adjust using the focus ring, which I will demonstrate. And of course, despite the fact that we cleaned this light just a few weeks ago, I can see that it's already accumulating cobwebs. So here it's very vertical, and as I rotate the ring, you can see that sort of ovalish shape rotating. Now it's more horizontal. It's like, an, it's like an oblong beam, not quite an ellipse, not quite an oval. It's kind of diagonal right there. And back to vertical. So since I spoke about Fresnel lenses earlier, I kind of have to show you one of the units we have here in the theater. So as you can see, we have the Fresnel lens here, which is just a smaller version of what you saw in the lighthouse images that I shared earlier. Um, I'd like to show you the interior of this light and how the lamp is fastened to a sled for focusing. Um, I will go ahead and pop open the front here. So it's just a spring-loaded pin. And this portion that supports the lens can drop down. So right now the sled is parked closer to the rear of the instrument and theoretically as I loosen this if I allow it to move forward we're going to get a wider beam. Yeah so the spotlight gets larger there when you slide the sled with the lamp forward. I have a couple more lighting instruments I want to demonstrate. Uh, now we're getting into the category of ancient relics that we still have here at the high field. They don't get used very often, but I mean, how fun is this light bulb? <laughs> it's almost the size of my head. This comically large light bulb is actually a 1000 watt lamp for an Olivet. This is an Olivet floodlight, and while we cannot be completely sure of the exact age, I've found images and documentation showing that they existed back in the 30s and the 20s, so it's very likely that this particular instrument has been around since this theater became a theater.
The output of this instrument is pretty incredible. I'm using one fixture and I'm lighting the entire stage pretty intensely. These floodlights are intended to sit on the ground as you see here, or be mounted to a wall to provide side light or illuminate a cyclorama. The last thing I want to show you, mainly because I'm curious to see it myself, is one of our two beam projectors. You want to turn it on? <laughs> so this beam projector has two reflectors. This piece at the front is obscuring a direct view of the lamp, but it's a small reflector, which is sending light back into the larger reflector, and it all comes shooting out. So it can be focused in a similar manner to the Fresnel fixtures. It's on a little sled and it has a couple, only like an inch and a half of movement. So we'll start with it pushed back. So here you can see a shadow from the support for that center reflector. So we probably should be much farther away from this curtain to really get a good idea of how this behaves. But this is with the sled toward the rear of the instrument. With the focus sled all the way forward, you can see there's still a lot of sort of spill light on the sides. But here we've got this very, very narrow, very intense hot spot in the center. It's a very hot light. Yeah, it feels very warm. <laughs> it's like a heat lamp. This concludes part one of two. I have so much more to share with you, so make sure to join me next week for the continuation of our journey through the world of theatrical lighting. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you found it illuminating. Behind the Scenes with Kristen Knutson is part of our larger series, Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible by a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you'd like to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, please visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Please join me next week for more demonstrations, looks behind the scenes at the Highfield Theater, as well as updates on construction on campus. Thank you.